We are going to be talking about Bitcoin and the future of American democracy. I'm here with U.S. Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee and Vivek Ramaswamy. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd love to get your reactions to what President Trump just said, as well as Senator Cynthia Lummis talking about having a strategic Bitcoin reserve for the United States. This is a historic moment here in Tennessee. It is indeed a historic moment, and I am so thrilled that President Trump has become the first presidential candidate to actually have a Bitcoin platform. I think that that is so significant, and what you're going to see from those of us in the Senate, once President Trump is inaugurated, is a push to make certain that those of you that are involved in Bitcoin have the energy that you need, low-cost, affordable, stable energy, so that you can do your Bitcoin mining. Another thing you're going to see us do is make certain that you can self-custody, and you're going to see us get the federal government off your back, out of your blue wallets, and let you control your life and have that freedom of transaction that Bitcoin allows. So I want to make an observation about President Trump's speech, and I think it was historic, not just because he gave that speech and it's in the interests of the people in this room. That's not why he made the commitments he did. He made the commitments he did because it's in the interests of the United States of America and the values that this country was founded on, and there is a difference. I think that if our founding fathers were alive today, they would have endorsed every one of the things that Donald Trump just said on that stage. It is part of a deeper cancer in this country where you think about what is sucking the lifeblood out of the United States of America. It is the rise of this fourth branch of government. The people who were never elected to run the government, who are actually writing rules that are affecting not only every one of you, but every American. I think what you're going to get out of that second Trump term isn't there to go around and just mess around the edges of it. We want to get in there and actually shut that down. That's how you revive this country, put that regulatory state in its place. You know, one of the things that we didn't necessarily hear from today, but I want to see become part of this conversation is every time one of these administrative agencies, you know, the SEC was discussed today, pursues an action that they end up losing in federal court, they're still putting people through hell in the process. You know what? If you lose, you pay. And to actually have accountability in the government for the cases they actually bring, so it's not a one-sided crusade, but there's actually accountability once and for all for the people who are actually making hell for American citizens. And I think that's where this conversation is going. We've heard President Trump talk about how he wants America to be first. What's at stake if another country adopts Bitcoin before us? So look, I think, the, go ahead, good Marsha. Now you have what? good thoughts on no, that. No, you, you go ahead on that and then I'll follow up. So look, I think that the United States of America was founded on the unapologetic pursuit of excellence. Excellence is our heritage. It is in our DNA as a country. And so what I think is at stake for the United States of America is really shame. The idea that we, through self-harm, constrained ourselves from achieving the maximum of what is possible in Bitcoin or in any other arena is, I think, a stain on our country. When we rallied behind the cry to make America great again, it was not just Donald Trump that we hungered for. It was for the unapologetic pursuit of excellence. That is who we are as Americans. That is our heritage. That is our identity. That's what's at stake in this room, right? When you say Bitcoin to the moon, you know, I know many people just want the, the value of their holding to go up, and that's fine. But I think it is a statement of a deeper point of American exceptionalism, right? We are the unbounded, the unbridled, the unafraid, the people who would not be constrained to achieve the maximum of our potential without any government or system standing in our way. That's what our founding fathers envisioned. And I think that culture, it has been domesticated, it has been tamed, it has been whipped into submission by this new culture that penalizes excellence and celebrates victimhood. While that inner animal has now leapt oceans to lift up places like China, 
And so, yes, when we say make America great again, what we want is to unleash that inner beast, unleash that inner animal spirit. And that's the animal spirit that I know motivates those of you in this room to achieve what you do. And that's what we're going to unleash again in January of next year. Yes, and I think as you look at what President Trump was saying and adding on to what Vivek is saying, what we realize is that there is a new axis of evil. It is Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. And we understand and fully appreciate if America is not first in this innovation, then the innovation is going to go to whomever is first whomever has the lowest barrier to entry. And we don't want that innovation, those bright minds, to leave our shores. We want those bright minds to be here. Likewise, that also means getting the federal government out of your way. And one of the things you will see from President Donald Trump is going to be a push to work with us in the Senate and in the House to rein in the federal government, to right-size these agencies, and to make certain that we're getting rid of a lot of these unnecessary rules and regulations and bureaucrats who spend their time shuffling paper and never answering the questions that we the people have of those agencies, whether it's the SEC, the FDIC, the IRS. So if you're going to open doors of opportunity, it means you remove the obstacles. And I think we have certainly defined what many of those obstacles are. Let's talk a little bit about transactional freedom. Yesterday, a lot of the people who came to the Bitcoin conference heard Edward Snowden say that America is the only advanced democracy that doesn't have a data privacy law. What are you going to do to prevent financial surveillance and really allow for transactional freedom? Natalie, I'm so glad you brought that up because since 2012, I have had legislation that would establish a national federal preemption on data privacy and allow you, the individual, to own what I call your virtual you, which is you and your presence online. Now, as we look at the expansion of Bitcoin and of crypto, as we look at the growth of AI, as we look at the speeds with quantum, what do we know? If you're going to have AI, if you're going to have transactional freedom, you have to have a national, federally preemptive data privacy and data security law so that you have the right to own your presence online. And you have the right to shield that from uh, being used to train, train large language models. And uh, our hope is that with Republicans in control of the Senate Commerce Committee, we will be able to pass and have President Trump sign into law a national data privacy standard. And I should say, these are, notice everything about Marsha's comments. These are not particularly partisan issues, right? And he mentioned the Republicans, and that's what's going to be required in a new majority after January. But this is not a Republican or Democrat issue, and it certainly shouldn't be. Same goes for the opposition to a central bank digital currency. What was the most popular argument for the adoption of one? And this is all about surveillance, too, by the way. The most popular argument is that, hey, China's doing it. They're going to a digital yuan, and so we have to do it in the United States to keep up with the Joneses or keep up with the Jinpings or whatever the, whatever the case may be. You have to step back and ask yourself why China is adopting a central bank digital currency or taking steps to adopt one is to implement a surveillance state by force that otherwise would not have been able to be implemented without that central bank digital currency. So I do think that these should transcend partisanship. I also want to make a prediction this year about the election because of this. I think there's a good number of people across the United States of America who will not say that they're going to vote for Donald Trump or for a Republican this year, but who absolutely stand for financial freedom. They call themselves single-issue voters in crypto, and 
I think one of the things I've found in the tech world, crypto world, Bitcoin world, is when you say you're a single issue voter, effectively that means you're voting for Trump this cycle and you don't want to just pronounce it in so many words. So my, my empirical prediction here is I think the polls are actually off by about at least 1%. I think whatever the polls look like, you can add 1% of it, and that's the way you're going to adjust it. If that prediction proves right this November, you can call that the Bitcoin bump or the crypto bump this November, because I do think when you look at the number of people who are actually using or adopting Bitcoin or crypto into your portfolio, who understand the assault on that by the regulatory state today through the back door, not even through the front door, I think we now have a clear choice between the two major candidates of who's going to be the right one to get that job done. And I think it's, Natalie, I think probably for the first time in history, going to have a measurable, palpable impact on the outcome of this election relative to the polling that you now see. And so that'll be a prediction I'll make today. Yeah, and if I can add one thing on the CBDC, this is something that as China started to push the digital yuan, when Beijing hosted the Olympics, some of us stepped forward to make certain that our U.S. athletes were shielded from that because of the surveillance that is built into that. And a CBDC leads to that social credit score. It leads to the government telling you how you can and cannot spend your money. And you know, Natalie, I think we all remember in 2022 when the Canadian government shut down the bank accounts of people that weren't willing to mask. And then you had the trucker strike and they shut down bank accounts. The federal government ought not to be messing with your transactional life. You want that freedom. Yeah, that event minted a lot of Bitcoiners. Uh, Vivek, I'm glad you brought up bipartisanship because one thing a lot of Bitcoiners love is that Bitcoin is a neutral currency, that it is apolitical. What if some people are watching this out there in their homes in America and they see President Trump embracing Bitcoin and now they see it as something that's going to be used as as a conservative tool, that maybe they should oppose it just because the other side is embracing it. What do you say? Should Bitcoin be apolitical and bipartisan? Yeah, so absolutely it should. In fact, this goes back to America's heritage. Alexis de Tocqueville traveled this country, what, over a century and a half ago. And one of the things he said is that the United States of America isn't actually supposed to last. The land is too expansive. It's too diverse in terms of the ethnic heritage of people. There's too many religious diverse, too much religious diversity. This isn't supposed to last unless there are certain what he called intermediary institutions that are apolitical, that you preserve from the sphere of partisan politics. And that's the sports of this country, the private sector of this country, the philanthropic institutions. But I would put Bitcoin in that category as well, where once that itself becomes politicized, then that, I think, is the beginning of the end. Listen really carefully to what you heard from President Trump. I know that was not delivered off the cuff, okay? Every one of those commitments he made were well thought out. And I think if he took the trouble, believe me on this, if you took the trouble of vetting it to say that it's going to go into that speech you heard today, he really means it and stands behind it. None of that involved the weaponization of a new tool to advance conservative ends. Sure, are there going to be some people who say that, hey, the right thing to do is to co-opt these administrative agencies and use them to advance conservative ends rather than progressive goals? Maybe some people who advocate for that and they're entitled to their view. But I think what we stand for is when we hopefully win this election and take over in January of 2025, we don't want to co-opt those three-letter agencies or the regulatory state. We just want to get in there and shut it down for everybody. Left, right, center, doesn't matter. That's how you revive the country on principle. And so, yes, do we want to keep it neutral? You're darn right. Capitalism is neutral. Capitalism is what unites us across our otherwise partisan differences. It's been politicized, I would argue, in the other direction. But the right answer there isn't to fight fire with fire. In this case, it is to fight fire with water. And that is how you actually preserve what our founding fathers envisioned in 1776. Let's talk a little bit about the American dream. It's been, it's been lost for so many people. It's been on the decline. And for many Bitcoiners, they believe that there will be a renaissance of the American dream if we can empower the average individual, to economically empower them. How do you see that playing out? I mean, what is the American dream? We we 
call it a dream. I, mean, I don't want to be poetic here, but it feels like, you know, you wake up from a dream, then you forget what it was all about. You remember the feeling of what it felt like. I think that's the zone we're in right now, and pretty soon you forget that too. And so, yes, I think the thing I was advised to say during the Republican presidential primary debates is the American dream is alive and well right now. It is not. It is alive and hanging on for life support. That's where we are. The American dream says not that we all have the same God-given gifts, because we don't. It's an uncomfortable truth, but it doesn't have to be uncomfortable. It's actually perfectly natural that every person has different gifts. But the American dream is built on the idea that no matter what your God-given gifts are, and every one of us has our own unique, different God-given gifts. You get to achieve the maximum of those gifts without any government or any system standing in your way, without your race or your gender or your sexuality standing in the way, without anybody telling you you can't achieve the maximum of your potential, and that, you know what, you are also free to speak your mind at every step of the way. That, to me, is the American dream. You don't have to choose between adopting one political viewpoint and putting food on the dinner table. We're the country where you get to enjoy both of those things at once. And so is that alive and well today? No, it's not. But I believe it can be. I think that if my kids are in high school, I got a four-year-old at home. If my kids are in high school before we get this right, I think, I think we're done. I think that's the time horizon we're working within. But I do believe that it is still possible to revive that American dream and to pass it on in even greater form now's our moment to do it. And I, one of the things I love about people in this room is regardless of your commitments to Bitcoin or Republicans or Democrats, it doesn't matter. That's something that I think most Americans still share in common. And we call it the American dream for a reason because it is distinctive to this country and we ought to be proud of it. We should be proud of it. And you don't hear people talk about the China dream or the Russian dream. You hear them talk about the American dream and making those dreams come true. What we know is this. In order for each and every individual to be able to live out their version of the American dream, it requires freedom, free people, and free markets. And we also know that in order for our country to stay free, it requires that we have robust, respectful, bipartisan debate. That has worked well in keeping this nation free. And we know that when you do that, what you, d you end up doing is opening doors of opportunity for all people. And that is where we should be. That if you have an idea and you work hard and the wherewithal to turn that idea into a project, to move it to commercialization, to move it to the marketplace, then that is going to be a springboard for you. And that is what each and every person loves to see. I love the enthusiasm and the hopefulness that you see in Bitcoin. I think that people beginning to work with Bitcoin. Here's a, a fun little story on that. I was at a dinner here in Nashville at a restaurant on Thursday night with some people from this conference. The gentleman that was waiting on our room talked about how excited he was when he found out it was some of those with the Bitcoin conference because when he was 18, he started putting his money into Bitcoin. And he talked about how this had opened doors of opportunity for him and how he saw this as his way to a better life. That kind of hopefulness, that kind of opportunity is what you want to preserve for every American citizen, everyone. I can relate to that. Bitcoin gave me hope for the future. Um, before we wrap up, I would love for you to share your vision of how Bitcoin will assimilate into the current financial system. Because right now, we have a system built on credit and debt. $35 trillion. I just recently met Congressman Tom Massey, who wears that debt clock. 
And a lot of people are concerned about that. How do we move from a system built on debt to one of Bitcoin? Look, I think that not all of this falls on the shoulders of policy, right? The rails are still being built as we speak. I mean, the hard reality is the government's getting in the way, but once you get the government out of the way, there still needs to be a lot of development of the market itself. If you look at most Americans today, even most of the Americans who will vote for Donald Trump in November, they don't have exposure to either Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in their own portfolio. Question is, you look at most people, how do they make those decisions? It's based on a wealth manager who tells them how to allocate their capital. In many cases, those wealth managers don't know the first thing about how to either own or let alone hold Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency. So I think a lot of this is going to also have to take place. The first step is getting the government out of the way through selective excise taxes on Bitcoin mining or backdoor regulatory action. That's the step for policymakers. But the rest of the job falls on those of you who are in the audience and people like you across the country to be able to say it's important to find there isn't really the kind of new nascent industry that thinks about what is the right intelligent portfolio allocation you know, whether it's 1% or more than 1%, whatever it is, most people are at zero with respect to exposure to cryptocurrency or to Bitcoin. And so I think that those are some market structures that are going to have to develop as well. The first step is certainly going to be the government getting out of your way. But the next step is it's going to require people stepping out of your own silos. One of the things I found is a lot of people, in, like any new industry or any new, any new movement, you know, people are very insular and in looking inwards at to the problems they want to solve. I think the biggest problems now are not microscopic problems, but actually interfacing with other industries, like, let's just say, the financial services sector or the wealth management industry more broadly. Probably the single biggest thing for crypto or future of Bitcoin would be the education of wealth managers across the country on how to actually balance a portfolio of everyday Americans they're advising. And so that's the kind of renewal and revival we're going to see after the policy impediments come out of the way. And that's what I see ahead. And when it comes to policy impediments, there are some things that federally can be done and ought to be done. We are working on legislation that would be a tax credit for Bitcoin mining so that this can be used as an economic development tool for counties and cities across the country, for individuals across the country. And it requires that low-cost energy and developing those energy sources. And President Trump talked a little bit about that. Also, looking at the ability, if your employer offers you a 401k, maybe instead of a 401k, you want to put your money into a Bitcoin ETF. And having that as an option, and for federal employees, through our federal employee retirement system, having an option B, a Bitcoin ETF. That speaks to the issue of more broad basing, the participation and the education on Bitcoin, because not everyone's like me, Natalie, and has a son named Chad who tries to teach you about this and make certain that you learn all about learn what is, what is there and that you know how to custody your wallet. So I think those are all things that can be done. To the debt, Vivek and I have actually talked a good bit about this issue. There are some tangible steps that could be taken to right-size the federal government. And I would love for President Trump on day one to freeze federal hiring to freeze federal salaries, to freeze federal spending. And then we have discussed, wouldn't it be great to have a government reform czar in the White House that says this rules, this set of rules, this set of regulations are unconstitutional and by executive order, they go away. And this is a way that we can put the attention on right-sizing so that the taxpayer of the future, my grandkids, my kids, are not going to be burdened with an out-of-control, wild-natured federal government spending. 
A lot of business and political leaders who embrace Bitcoin, I get the sense it's personal for them. And we have a saying in Bitcoin, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. So I want to leave this with, how has Bitcoin changed you? Yeah, well, I actually wanted to close on, on this point, if I may, Natalie, is you've been, you, we've, we've given a lot of positive nuggets that are tangible, as tangible as ever been given by policymakers, starting from President Trump on down, for what you can expect in a, not only a second Trump term, but an administration that hopefully includes great senators like Marsha Blackburn and others with majorities in the Senate and in Congress. But I do want to take this final close to, because I think we're wrapping up here, is to flip this a little bit. Okay. I think we've talked a lot about what you're going to get from the right kinds of policymakers in the Bitcoin community. But I'm going to, I'm going to make an ask of you too. It's a two-way street. The same love and passion, and it is passion, that brings together people in the Bitcoin community here for that common purpose. I'm going to ask you, maybe not today, but over the course of the months ahead, through the election and into next year, to channel that back into your love of our country as well. Right? Bitcoin and the United States of America, your love of Bitcoin are two sides of the same coin. And it was a country that supported unbridled and unbounded innovation and unbounded spirit that allowed something that allows something like Bitcoin to exist and thrive in the first place. That the thing I'll say in closing is we've talked a lot and we could keep going on and there's gonna be other good stuff that we haven't talked about here either. But this isn't just a festival celebrating, you know, what the next government is going to do for Bitcoin as a sector. We're doing it not because it's right for Bitcoin, but because it's right for the United States of America. And I want to ask every one of you to love the United States of America every bit as much as you love Bitcoin. And if we do, then our kids' best days are still going to be ahead of them. And that's what I will ask in asking of you in return. So thank you. And I, just to add to that, I had a, uh, we had a neighbor here in Tennessee who was the CEO of the National Federation of Independent Business. And he spent decades working with small businesses around this country. And he would always tell them, a simple message is this. You need to be involved in politics because politics is involved in your business every single day through laws, rules, and regulations. So I would encourage each of you, this is a great country. Believe in this country and believe in yourselves to make a difference in this country. Get active, stay active, and remember in November, you need to go vote. The orange wave is coming. One, one. Senator yeah, Marsha America to the moon. That's what we'll say in closing. All Senator right. Marsha Blackburn, Vivek Ramaswamy, everyone. Next year, we are bringing the Bitcoin conference to the American West, Las Vegas. The brightest minds in the world will converge to deliver Bitcoin history. Buy your tickets now at b.tc slash conference slash 2025.